Okay, so in this first of our, hopefully uh, several, at least, uh, podcasts that we're planning to do, I'm here with the Head of the Department of War Studies and International and Professor of International Relations, Mervyn Frost, um, who's uh, probably well known to many of the people in the department, uh, regardless of whether you've had personal contact with him. And we're just going to have a bit of a talk about his, your role, Professor, within the department. It's hopefully interesting to some. Um, the first question is perhaps quite a, a, a generic one. Uh, how, how did you come to the department? Uh, where were you before and why, why did you come to King's? I was, for 10 years I was head of a department of political science at the University of Natal in Durban, South Africa. And from there I moved to the University of Kent. And Kent had an outpost in London called the London Centre for International Relations. And I used to teach there. And for a series of complex reasons, that centre seceded and joined King's. So I joined King's in 2003. Okay. So, and, and when after then were you, did you become head of the department? I, I became head six years ago, so that was 2007. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Was, so several years before yes, yes. my time here, so yes, I, wasn't, I wasn't sure yes. the exact time. And so, and you're a professor in international relations with, I, I believe, something more related to ethics. Yeah. Um, what, what, what's your background? Well, well let me give you the background. Is when I got my very first academic job, I pitched up and I was trained as a political philosopher, and also in general political science. And my head of department said, "Well, Frost, please, would you teach this course in international relations?" And I didn't know anything about it. So uh, I had to rush around and learn something very, very quickly. And as I got into this new discipline that I found myself teaching, I discovered here was a whole discipline with almost no interest in ethics at all. So uh, in those days, this is the mid-70s, what people studied uh, were balances of power, nuclear deterrence, mutual assured destruction, uh, the whole question of nuclear disarmament and so on, and there was very, almost no interest in ethical questions. And it soon became clear to me that all the questions that interest ethicists are of relevance to international relations, so I started writing about this. So, for example, there's the question of justice, just distribution. Why is it that um, there's enough food in the world to feed everybody? and yet it all ends up concentrated in some places, uh, while other places are starving, and there are massive famines where tens of hundreds of thousands of people die. That seems to me on the face of it unjust. It's not that there's a shortage of food, it's just in the wrong place. And uh, a philosopher called Singer had written about this, and I got interested in that. Then there, there are questions of human rights as well. Uh, how come some states are good and focus on protecting human rights of the people in themselves in those states. Whereas in other cases, you find human rights being abused by the state governments that are supposed to be protecting the rights of their own citizens. Wherever I looked, I saw ethical questions and uh, I started writing about those. Certainly, I mean, it seems to uh, reflect perhaps the department in a way and bringing ideas from another discipline towards the interpretation of a international relations in this case, which, uh, as far as I'm concerned, oh, it's a mutating discipline, what I've studied yeah. if I are. Like, the issues are the same, but how you interpret them always change. And no, well, you, you're quite right about mutating. So, so this department had been a department of war studies up until uh, 1990 or so, and it focused almost exclusively on the history of warfare with a, very, a single person studying philosophy, uh, the philosophy of war. And then uh, in, in 1991 it introduced a, a bachelor's degree and at about the same time as the staff then started expanding, uh, other disciplines were brought in. And so what is taught in war studies has changed and grown uh, in an organic way as these new disciplines come in. I mentioned earlier that we joined, uh, Professor Jabri and I came in 2003. We brought with us international relations, the discipline. 
uh, and we had a degree called the MA in International Relations. And very soon, this was the biggest MA in the department. And since then, uh, between 2003 and now, we've had a huge growth in the number of students and staff who teach uh, a number of aspects of international relations. Sure. And I think this feeds back into world studies in a very useful way. Of course, yeah, no, I'd say, uh, speaking for myself, uh, doing this role that I do do, you see yes. the amount of postgraduate students who come from all over the world to study here is phenomenal in a way. I mean, it's a huge and growing department. It seems to well, grow each year. It's, well, it's phenomenal. I might be head of department, but I sit here in amazement watching what has happened in this short time. So we started with a, a single MA, the MA in War Studies. We now have 14 different MA programs, um, all thriving. Uh, some of them more than thriving. Some of them have got the MA in International Relations has about 110 students in it. The MA in Conflict Security and Development uh, has has 120 students. So all in all, I think we have 350 MA students. Um, it's just been phenomenal. Uh, and, and the interest of the students, I think, is the multidisciplinarity of this department. Sure, I mean, I, I certainly can uh, vouch for that myself. Anyway, uh, building on that sort of trend, I mean, obviously it's been a huge period of growth up, up to this point. Um, projecting a bit into the future, where do you see the War Studies Department growing uh -huh. in, in, in the medium future? Well, it's not so much, the, it, it's the immediate future. As we sit here now, we're busy recruiting into our newest uh, project, which is a new BA in International Relations, which starts in September. We opened, we had to do all the paperwork and the preparation and so on, la, uh, end of last calendar year. We opened the booking for the new degree in December, and we've already had over 200 applications for 70 places. So this is, we, we're somewhat stunned at the, at, the, at the popularity of this degree that hasn't even started yet. And the implications are now over the next three years, um, you know, next year is the first year of the BA, then the following year there will be years one and two, and then the following year we'll have our first graduates uh, from this new degree. And I'm, I'm supposing that uh, uh, in the not too distant future we'll be challenging, for example, the LSE for having, a, you know, one of the most vibrant undergraduate degrees in, in international relations in the country. So they, um, from my knowledge of LSE, they, oh, they, seem to, they seem to be ranked very highly in a lot of areas, but I, I can't, perhaps War Studies is vulnerable to the same charge, but that they don't seem to have a lot of competition, at least within London, within some of these areas, international relations. Well, well they've got competition now. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we're bringing some competition on, onto their lawn. <laughs> yeah. it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see, although obviously yes. uh, I'll be an alumnus by then. Um, <laughs> So, as you say, as, as you mentioned to me before, I think, becoming head of the department involves a certain amount of becoming an administrator and an organiser rather than a professor. Uh, what's, so, with regards to the history of your, say, publications, you must have moved away from that Well, yeah, Well, certainly, I, I haven't had as much time to f devote to um, research and writing as I used to have. Nevertheless... I'm very proud to say I've been head for six years, but I've published a book in that period, and I've published five or six key articles, which I'm pleased with. So I'm happy to say I, my writing hasn't died altogether, but I'm looking forward to next year when I have a period of sabbatical leave to resurrect uh, my own reading and writing. Um, but, but could I just uh, go back to say something you said about the role of head of department. It is administrative, but, but probably more important is, is, the, is a kind of leadership nurturing role. Sure. You've got, the department has grown from 24 staff when I started to 44 now. And a lot of the newcomers need to be, you know, looked after as they get their own careers going. Uh, and, Many of them haven't taught a lot before, so their hands need to be held to some extent. So, so interesting. It seems all around seems like it's quite an interesting period of growth over the last yes. years for the department. There's um, one area I haven't mentioned, which is probably the even more striking, is that uh, we used to have I don't know, two score uh, PhD students. 
uh, we now have a, a really huge cohort of PhD students uh, in this department, over 250 of them. Um, so, you know, when you talk about the department, uh, this is now a real major constituency of our students. So out of a thousand students overall, 250 of them are PhD students. Now, to me, that's the mark of a really mature department because what we've got then is this research cohort. Uh, you've got the undergraduates who you're busy teaching, the MA students who's a mixture of teaching and research, but your PhDs, it is they who signify the research culture of the department. And, it, and this one's now got a very, very strong research culture. Sure, I say it's uh, obviously from our perspective, you don't see them so much as an undergraduate student, but they're there and they, these are the, say, that uh, they're the future of the department in a way that they're no, exactly. not necessarily that they'll stay here, of course, but the, the ideas that they're generating. Uh, well, you hope, I, I, it's there where you hope for um, uh, having an effect beyond the department because what one hopes, and I'm pretty sure will happen, is our PhDs will then occupy. Lecture, lecturing positions around the country, both here and abroad, uh, far east in Africa, in, in the Americas. So the war studies brand will be carried, for, and the research ethos will be carried forward by our own graduates, and that's just wonderful. Yeah, no, it's uh, yeah. So good to good to know the future in it. After all, um, there's a. Uh, you, obviously, you've had as a as the head of the department, you're like a sort of the, the the first point of contact for it for high level sort of issues. I mean, recently the defense secretary, outgoing defense secretary of the United States, Leon Panetta, came here, and uh, back in November, I was lucky enough to meet Nigel Scheinwald, who I, I met with you. Is there a single experience that stands out of those, or is it all are they all good in their own way? I mean, no. Well, uh, they're they're all pretty good in their own way. Um, I, I wouldn't single out any one. We, we've had a number of ministers, um, uh, ministers of defence come in and speaking to us. We've had very... I guess the most interesting for me, as a person who had never come across this before, is that uh, we run a number of courses for the intelligence community. And, um, uh, you know, for the man in the street, which I was before... before that's a community you never ever come into touch with, uh, into contact with. And now, suddenly, we, we run these short courses for the intelligence agencies. And um, extraordinary impressive group of people. Uh, and um, I, I found talking to them very enlightening indeed. Okay. And then we also, another area that is of interest is... Um, we have an international centre for the study of radicalisation and political violence, and and there too they brought me into contact with people I wouldn't normally meet. Um, ex uh, extraordinarily interesting and um, encouraging, really. Sure. Oh, yeah. So I was, I was speak, being taught by Professor LeBeau, although I know there are yes, others. Yes. The link between policy, as his career has had, you know, with yes, working with the yes, Carter administration, yes, among others. It's just that, that fascinating um, rebuttal to the ivory tower sort of cliche that's attached to academics. But I think, yeah. I personally think the War Studies Department is doing an increasing job of combating that through its actions. No, well, you're certainly right there, is that more than any other department I've ever worked in, we have uh, uh, succeeded in translating our research into policy impact rather, uh, rather successfully. And it happens... Part of it is simply uh, the lack of our geographical location. Here we are, you know, not more than a few hundred yards from Whitehall. Uh, but it's also the kind of research that we do uh, across counterterrorism, intelligence, um, uh, working with the NGOs, working with uh, on issues of risk and resilience, working on issues of um, reforming. Uh, Military, military structures and so on. We've got work being done on military health. So one of our more successful centres is the King's Centre for Military Health Research, which has done, well, it's world-leading research on post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, 
and this feeds directly into the policy process. So we had a Minister of State here a few weeks ago uh, being presented with the findings of the latest round of research, which will then go directly into his, his policy formulation. Sure. That's um, just interesting to see how it forms. And as, as everyone who studies here knows, war studies by its definition is such a broad sort yeah. of idea. It's hard yeah. to sum it up in a sentence, as I'm sure any of the students try to when someone from outside the department asks what war studies is. Um, but it's interesting to hear uh, issues like this about how the, the breadth and depth of impact and, in yeah. my view, excellence, obviously, um, that War Studies has is just fascinating to hear about. And Well, it is. I guess in response to that, I would say that uh, there's this distressing effect, uh, but it will be with us forever, is that uh, a central experience of humans down the centuries has been conflict and warfare. There's a lot less warfare now than there was before. But nevertheless, it is still endemic, it is still with us. We can't anticipate a time when we needn't be bothered with it at all. Because it's such a profound uh, experience for everybody involved, um, the study of this profound experience is of great significance for pretty much everyone. You know, everyone I know has got a, a cousin, a grandfather, an aunt, an uncle who is involved in a war somewhere. Uh, now what we do is we study these conflicts with a view to understanding what causes them so that we might try and do things differently next time. We also study how to fight these wars so if we do get involved in a war we can do it well uh, and not expend too much money or people or loss of materials and so on in doing so. Sure. It's certainly a, a, it's a depressing but interesting fact that this department's always going to be relevant. There's never been a time when you can say, oh, we don't need to study this anymore. Um, no, well, I, I, I agree with that. It, it, it is depressing. I mean, you might easily draw a correlation between the growth of this department from really quite a small department to what is now a very big department. And it coincides more or less exactly with the period post 9-11. So, <laughs> so, so suddenly post 9-11, governments were pouring money into security. And uh, this money stream created jobs in all sorts of sectors, from the police to the intelligence to the military to the counter-terrorism people. Uh, uh, a new field in this area is, has to do with cyber warfare, so people are pouring money into cyber security. All this money creates jobs for the kinds of students we're busy producing. So, as you say, it starts with the depressing premise <laughs> that ends up with a productive unit that we've got here. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. That's uh, good, to know, good to know that our academic fortunes sort of mirror the, the wider world, <laughs> yes. so to speak. So again, to dispel the yeah. ivory tower reference. But uh, again, it's perhaps my better inclinations, I think our time is up. So Professor Frost, Head of the Department of War Studies, thank you for your time, and thanks everyone for listening. Harry, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you.